In the 1860s, America is divided by civil war and 2,000 miles of untamed land west of the Mississippi. At this time, it was way easier to travel to Europe from the east coast of the US than to get to California. But one man has an audacious dream to connect the country. America needs a transcontinental railroad. It's a daunting engineering challenge. This was one of the biggest accomplishments in world history. Literally moving mountains to finally connect the coasts. This is the race to build the Transcontinental Railroad. It's the middle of the 19th century, and the United States is extending its territory westward, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. But for settlers attempting the journey, what they encounter is nearly unfathomable. Traversing this is a major undertaking. It's known as the Great American Desert. From about midway through Nebraska out to the Rocky Mountains, it's a no man's land as far as white Americans are concerned. The thing about the West is a harsh environment. If you're riding in a wagon, you can only go about 20 miles a day, which means that you're going to be on the wagon trail for months and months and months. You might get caught in the winter in the mountains, which of course is death for you and your family. Then, almost overnight, the number braving the journey explodes to some 300,000 in what will become known as the Gold Rush. And in the late 1840s, gold was discovered. Huge amount of wealth was being generated in California. People wanted to get out there and be part of that growth, but it was almost impossible to get there. You have to remember at this time, it was way easier to travel to Europe from the east coast of the US than to get to California. There are alternative routes by sea, but they're exponentially longer. It was tens of thousands of miles. Or you had to take a steamship down to Panama or Nicaragua, make an overland journey, then get another boat up the coast to San Francisco. If you were to go the long way around the tip of South America, it could take six months because you're at the mercy of winds. There is a faster method on the horizon, railroads. But of the little track that's been built by 1860, 96% is east of St. Louis. There is only one established railroad west, but it's contained to California. And now its innovative designer is working on something bigger. Members of Congress, esteemed members of Congress, America needs a transcontinental railroad to connect the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. Theodore Judah was a real visionary. He was also one of the first civilian engineers in the US. He was a big believer in using those skills to improve the world, to make life better for people. The notion of building a transcontinental railroad in the 1860s is almost fantastic to think about because nothing of that size had ever been even attempted before. And so it was like a moonshot. You have railroad companies struggling to cross something like the Allegheny Mountains, and he says, let's cross the entire continent. You're talking about 2,000 miles of rail. This would be like someone today in our environment saying, you know what we should do? We should colonize Mars now. Let's do that. Judah convinces four Sacramento businessmen to invest in his impossible dream. Led by millionaire merchants Charles Crocker and Leland Stanford, who will go on to found Stanford University, they form the Central Pacific Railroad. They're known as the Big Four. To put Judah's ambitious plan into action, they need to convince Congress to award them the largest government contract in history. Luckily for them, Washington is about to realize the true power of the railway. 
In July of 1861, three months after war is declared, the first major battle of the Civil War is underway. A quick win for the North could end it all. But when 11,000 Confederate reinforcements arrive by train, Lincoln is handed an embarrassing loss. And a protracted war becomes inevitable. The Transcontinental Railroad becomes critical for reaching Western states during the expansion and ensuring that those territories don't secede to the Confederate side. Three months later, Lincoln signs the Pacific Railroad Act, authorizing the building of a transcontinental railroad. And Judah and the Central Pacific are hired to make it happen. But there's a catch. He's here. Your persistence paid off. We have half the job. Lincoln chartered a second company. The Union Pacific Railroad. They'll build from east to west, and we'll build from west to east. The act is intended to create competition, laying out incentives for Judah's Central Pacific and his counterpart, Thomas Durant, to lay as much track as they can. The way that Congress has legislated the creation of the Transcontinental Railroad, any mile that the Central Pacific lays or the Union Pacific lays is going to mean a windfall of mineral rights for future mining and so forth, as well as just flat out cash, U.S. bonds. The payout is $16,000 for every mile, three times that over rough terrain between 250 and 800,000 per mile today. With no designated meeting point, the faster each company works, the more they take from their competitor. And in the summer of 1868, Durant's Union Pacific reaches a milestone in Wyoming, 888 miles, the halfway point between Sacramento and Omaha. Yet Durant has no intention of slowing down until the government intervenes. The government wants us to finalize a meeting point with Central Pacific. There is no way they could beat our mileage at this point. So it shouldn't matter where we end. That's not the point. I prefer to keep making money. The profits are so tempting that as both railroads reach Utah, they each lay track beds that extend past their rival's track by more than 100 miles. By January 1869, the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific have graded well past each other. Both are trying to seize as much land as they possibly can, both asserting that they are the ones laying the real transcontinental rail. The unnecessary cost is the last straw for President Ulysses Grant. He demands the sides come together and reach an agreement on where they'll meet. After a six-year struggle and nearly 21 million sledgehammer swings since President Lincoln began it, his goal of unifying the country has finally become a reality. As the Transcontinental Railroad connects the nation with a final golden spike. This was one of the biggest accomplishments in world history in terms of engineering. The country went wild. More cannons were fired in celebration of that event than during the Battle of Gettysburg. Prior to completion, it would take six months and today's money, tens of thousands of dollars to travel from New York to San Francisco. With the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, it takes a week, it costs a couple of hundred bucks, and it's safe and efficient. The railroad opens up the Western frontier to a whole greater swath of American citizens at different price points, different class opportunities. Different kinds of people are, are able to get access to the West in ways in which it was much more cost prohibitive just a few years earlier. Over the next five years, 350,000 people cross the country on the Transcontinental Railroad. 
along with today's equivalent of over $102 billion of freight. Materials from all over the country could go from one place to another. Industrialization could happen in different parts of the United States. And whatever they produce could be sent not only within the United States, but also to Asia and to Europe. Crocker and Durant are rewarded handsomely for connecting the coasts. About $2.3 and $3.6 billion in today's money, respectively. But the land grants they're awarded are worth even more. At over 175 million acres, it's more land than the entire state of Texas. A century later, the Union Pacific buys up both competitors and today operates 32,000 miles of track solely for hauling freight. Rail now makes up the backbone of America's shipping industry, moving over 1.7 billion tons of goods a year worth over $219 billion.